welcome back to Finding Wendy, my journey, uh, my wellness journey, and this is episode eight. Wow, it's going fast. So today I have a very, very special guest, uh, Fred Rootman. Did I say your last name right, Fred? No, but you came close. Okay, great. It's and Rutman. How, Rutman, okay. Yes. I don't know, I guess I pronounce it a Dutch way because of my Dutch mm-hmm. heritage. Uh, but welcome, welcome to my podcast. I'm very excited to have you as you're my very first intermittent fasting podcast guest because mm-hmm. I uh, recently started intermittent fasting myself, all thanks to someone we similarly have in common, and that is uh, Jin, Jin Stevens, who, is ro- who mm-hmm. wrote many, many books, and you have also mm-hmm. written a book. I have to make sure this gets in. Uh, focus here and Jen Stevens who has written many books um, about um, intermittent fasting but let's just uh, jump right into your um, medical history and your trauma and can you share with us particularly what happened so the thing that really stuck out with me because I was listening you were on Jen's podcast and you were talking about uh, the fact that you had 35 concussions and you have two pacemakers so wow that's Mm -hmm. Uh, quite the journeys. Um, so yeah, enlighten us. What happened? What's going on? In the um, in the summer of two thousand nine, I started what the doctors thought was me passing out randomly, and we later discovered I wasn't passing out. I was actually dying. Oh, I, God, I was I was being clinically dead, and it happened twenty times in that summer, and I guess. Definition of clinically dead is your heart doesn't beat for 30 seconds or more and you stop breathing for 30 seconds or more. So I've gone from fairly minimalist to just over 30 seconds to the worst we think was about five minutes. That's a long time to not be breathing. Most times when that happened to me, I fell down and hit my head on whatever was the hardest object in the vicinity, be it a curb, a commercial cement sink, manhole cover, anything like that, car door. So that resulted a lot of brain damage, a lot of concussions, post-concussion syndrome, and a whole bunch of PTSD and associated. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds yes, horrible. I guess. Were you living in, yeah, uh, just by the way, everybody know, not everybody knows where the two of us are. I'm in Toronto and Fred's in Toronto. So that's, mm-hmm. uh, that's great. And did these, did this happen while you were living in Toronto or were you living somewhere yes. else at the time? Yeah. yeah. And, um, and so you were in and out of the hospital many, many times and they basically did lots and lots of tests and you got obviously in touch uh, you you got a cardiologist and now you were um, working towards getting all sorts of surgeries and two pacemakers well the two pacemakers are the result of a lot of shenanigans i'll use that for lack of a better word and i'll also put in a disclaimer i'm not trying to put the blame on anybody for what's happened to me because it's what's happened to me is like a you know, a one in five billion kind of event. It was just a series of happenstance that could never have happened, but it did. And for example, it shouldn't have taken them four months to diagnose what was happening to me. It's part of that. You know, it's, it's very, very difficult to diagnose um, any, anything if they, I, I had a similar experience where I had a pulmonary embolism before I Mm -hmm. did this whole weight loss journey. Uh, I had bariatric surgery six years ago. And before that, I weighed over 450 pounds. And I had uh, pulmonary embolism, but to this day, they don't know um, if it was actually, um, what do you call it? something to do with the heart as well so either pulmonary Mm -hmm. embolism or there's a there's a way to explain it i can't remember the word anymore the moment i turn 65 the moment i turn 65 all sorts of words disappear out of my head all of a sudden but Mm -hmm. um but anyway took that get back get back into you i I digress sorry it's not about me it's about you (laughs) so you uh, uh they finally were able to get to a diagnosis um so 
from from there, how did you start getting into intermittent fasting? Well, it took a while. It, let's let's go back to the pacemakers for a bit. Sure. So the first pacemaker they put in was in 2009. And it took them so long to diagnose me because they weren't looking for anything beyond me having a heart attack. So there was a whole bunch of cognitive bias on the doctor's part. Right. And you keep testing for the same thing that's not there, you're going to get the same results. So they eventually tried a different test and they found out I had a certain heart condition that could be accommodated by a pacemaker and they slapped in the pacemaker. In 2013, it was like my Groundhog Day. Everything started happening all over again. I started wow. collapsing and hitting my head and everything. And it took them quite a while to figure out what was happening. And the pacemaker was defect. So they had to replace it. And I went in for the surgery and it didn't go so well. It was, it was a failure. And in fact, I coded on the table. Oh my God. So then I was in the hospital for another probably eight or 10 days because they had to make sure I didn't get an infection from that first surgery. Right. And then they also had a terrible time getting in the new pacemaker. So um, it wasn't a perfect fit and it caused the pacemaker to drain the battery prematurely. These things should last for my condition. 10 to 15 years and uh, and we barely got five out of them. So in 2018, this happened over again. So, you know, more concussions, more clinically dead, more brain damage, et cetera. And uh, they tried to put in a new pacemaker. They couldn't get it in because veins had collapsed. So your pacemaker runs with little leads that go to your heart. And um, I had so many of those in there and the vein collapsed, they couldn't put any more pacemaker leads in. And they had to put in a second pacemaker to back up the first one that was still failing. Yeah, yeah. And then, so going back then to, to the fact that your cardiologist uh, recommended um, the intermittent fasting program for you, in, in, in what way, why did he recommend this? Well, at the time, there were a number of the cardiologists in my primary hospital that had all been to Jason Fung's, I don't know if you have a Jason, yes, you do, yes, you have the obesity yep, code. Yep. Up here, up right here, the obesity code. Dr. Jason also, Fung, based here in Toronto. And uh, they were all impressed with the results he was getting for his patients. So they started promoting it in the cardiac ward. So That's, uh, that's uh, actually really, really good news because it's the hardest thing about the whole medical system is um, many, many um, doctors, uh, specialists I'm finding don't really have extensive training in nutrition. And that mm -hmm. I think it's a, a huge breakthrough with the work that Dr. Jason Fung did with um, and with this book that uh, many of us have now read, The Obesity Code and The Diabetics Code, that, um, that nutrition is such a very, very important part of your overall, it's not, not necessarily just about weight loss, um, but but also it improves your health of your heart. So in the case of intermittent fasting, what was the um, benefits for having uh, and starting intermittent fasting? Well, when I started, which was the summer of 2018, it was still mostly all about weight loss. That was the big yeah. goal behind weight loss. So nobody was really focusing on the health benefits that go along with it. Right. And what I learned through being a moderator in Jin's group is there are hundreds of health benefits. Yes. So just for me, I was type two diabetes. I was on a significant amount of insulin every day. And within six months, I, my sugar numbers were back to normal and yep. I was off insulin. Wow. That's great. So they were treating yeah. you with insulin for type two diabetes. Yes. Yeah. 
Because what he also talks about in this book is that he gets to the point, it gets to the point with many type 2 diabetes patients where it's, you know, because you're insulin resistant, you don't give the patient more insulin, um, you change their dietary, um, the, the diet, and in this case, you, you get them involved with um, intermittent fasting. Mm -hmm. And so you, you've been on it since 2018, which is great, which is great. And what, um, which kind of intermittent fasting do you do? So there are different formulas. There's, um, mm -hmm. you fast for 12 hours. You have a, I don't know, a six hour eating window. What is your fasting um, method? It varies by day and what's going on in my life. So that's one of the amazing things about intermittent fasting. Yes. Is you can structure it how it works for you. Right. And you you don't have to be perfect every day and you don't have to have that diet mindset. So when they initially gave me the okay to start fasting, because I had I think six doctors deciding whether I could actually try this because my medical condition was so wacko. Yeah. Uh, I started started on twelve twelve. 12, 12. And so just, yeah. um, just uh, for everybody who's listening, who doesn't know anything about inter uh, intermittent fasting, what does 12, 12 mean? It means I have a 12 hour eating window and a 12 hour fasting. window. So when you talk about a eating window, it doesn't mean you're supposed to eat for 12 hours consistently or consecutively. It means you can eat during that 12 hour period and then you give your body and digestive tract a 12 hour break during your fast. Right. So and in that 12 I, hours, do you follow the 12 hour eating window? Do you follow a low carbohydrate or um, any kind of special sort of uh, food choices that you use? I don't have a particular diet because we're trying to get people out of the diet mindset. Yes. You know, people will eventually find an eating pattern that works best for them. Some people yeah. will go more whole foods. Some people will go more meat heavy or poultry heavy or fish heavy. So as you'll find out when you talk to Jin, we're all an experiment of one and we all work slightly differently, even though we all work the same. Yeah. So, and your gut biome um, will change drastically yeah. over your first year and your gut biome is basically what drives a lot of your cravings. So once it gets accustomed to eating better quality foods, it will guide you to eating better quality foods. Yeah, whole foods, um, not not processed foods, but from what I've been reading from Jen's book is that, um, uh, you know, the, the actual name of, of the book um, denied, um, Delay, yeah, don't delay, deny. delay, don't deny that you you have days where you're going to uh, fast, but you also have days that you're going to feast. So, for for example, at Christmas, um, you know, you you're you're just your mindset is you're going to just eat everything. You're just going mm -hmm. to, and it's and it's it's not wrong and it's not terrible, and you just sort of set set yourself up for if you're going to have chips, chocolate cake eggnog whatever you have it and um and then you experience it now the other thing that i wanted to talk about with types of food or i myself don't drink alcohol do you drink any mm. alcohol at all not really no no because apparently that really does uh, put a kicker in your fasting in in uh, into the fasting sort of uh it takes longer for your body to recover if you drink alcohol um, during your 12 hour or six hour window um, than normal. So with your diabetes uh, management now, so you're, you said you no longer are using insulin? No longer using yeah. insulin. Yeah, that's great. And how long did that take approximately um, when you started fasting and then Gradually, um, I guess you were you were uh, meeting up with a di uh, um, diabetes uh, specialist, and you were tracking mm -hmm. everything and doing regular blood tests. And at what point did you stop using insulin? About six months. Six months. Okay. Okay. That's yeah. great. It's great news. It's great news. It's it's incredible. This whole world for me is just so like as you can see, I, I bought pretty much every book there is. Um, about intermittent fasting 
Um, and it makes total sense to me because it's just like every time somebody explains it uh, and it's like, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I, I have days where I don't eat many, actually many, many, many out of seven days. I don't actually eat breakfast. I don't really eat mm -hmm. until like 12 or one o'clock in the afternoon. So if you have a, a, a window where you're just going to eat lunch and eat dinner that's your six hour window and then you can fast the rest of the time so now mm -hmm. i'd like to hear what you eat or don't eat or drink during your fasting period well during the fasting period um pretty much water yeah that's it either tap water or, or like a soda stream kind of thing yeah. yeah i almost never drink anything if i've had a day where i've been outside and it's been very hot and i've done a lot of uh, exercise and sweating, I might do a Gatorade. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, that's in my eating window. Otherwise, that's it. For yeah. regular meals, I, I don't really constrain myself. I, what has really changed for me is the volume of food that I eat has gone down remarkably. And because I eat a lot less processed food or ultra processed food you know all your other hormones rebalance and now when i'm satiated i um if i've eaten enough that my body is happy by volume i get a little everybody's got these little quirky things that they do some mm -hmm. people sigh some people have an extended yawn that's my little signal that i've actually eaten enough and it's time to uh, recognize that that portion was good for me. That is very cool because it's, um, as I mentioned, I had bariatric surgery. So I have, you know, 80% of my stomach has been taken out. So I know when I'm full, it's, uh, mm -hmm. I don't have very much room in my stomach. And then there are also a lot of people that have had the roux and why, and that's, that's a whole different kettle of fish. And, and by the way, mm -hmm. ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, if you're thinking about doing intermittent fasting, you must see your health practitioner before you even decide to do it, especially anybody who's had Rue and Y, because Rue and Y, you can't eat big meals. You have to like graze the entire time in order to get in the right amount of protein and everything. So speaking mm -hmm. of protein and nutrients, do you, do you track your food at all? Do you know how much protein you've eated, eaten during the day? And I know how much protein you're supposed to get for... You know, every pound or kilo of body weight is, you know, the hot new topic. They they talk about it's all a lab laboratory construct. Okay. But very rarely do you ever come across an obituary, you know, saying somebody died from a protein deficiency. Yes, it's true. It's true. Um you know, and 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 so, you know, the interesting thing, so for yourself, it wasn't, wasn't about weight loss, but it was about heart health. So because of this uh, intermittent fasting that you're doing now, how has that affected your heart health and your affected your pacemakers and all that sort of thing? Well, initially it was about the weight loss, but okay. as, I, as I said, the doctors really didn't know, there wasn't a lot of science behind all the parallel weight um, health benefits that were going on with intermittent fasting. So doctors being like most of us, they say shiny object, weight loss, easy fix, recommend it to the patient. They really didn't know all these other great things were going to happen. So for my condition, there is no recovering from it. The nerve bundles in my heart died and it, all the intermittent fasting in the world wasn't going to make them come back to life. No. So the, where the intermittent fasting does come into play is it helps get down your basal insulin levels. And we have a pool of insulin. Your body produces insulin 24-7. And, you know, when you eat something or smell something delicious, yeah, it, it increases that. Mm -hmm. If your pool gets overfilled, it has negative consequences on the body and it hardens your arteries. So right. that will cause your blood pressures to go up because your arteries can't expand and contract like they used to before you had all that excess. So one of the things intermittent fasting does very quickly is it lowers your basal insulin level. 
And once your insulin levels start to normalize, most of your other hormones start to normalize <clears throat> along with in just uh, a cascading effect of of health blessings. Yeah, yeah. Really what it is. It's, it's, uh, it's incredible that how many health benefits uh, there are to uh, basic weight loss, but now taking the next step for me with this intermittent fasting because it's just calories and calories, calories in and calories out. Um, the amount of research that I've been doing now is basically generated by the big food companies. They, you know, they don't mm -hmm. make any money. They don't make any money if everybody stops eating. And the old uh, wives tale about breakfast is the most important meal of the day, that was created by the cereal companies. That's, you don't need to eat breakfast. Breakfast means break fast. And so I wanted to talk just um, shortly, quickly, because I'm having issues with this myself is sleeping. Mm -hmm. So I'm w waking up now two, three times a night. I used to wake up maybe once or twice, but now like mm -hmm. when I first started, I, I woke up six times in one night. And mm -hmm. I know that sleeping is really, really important to as a reset during your fasting as well. So can you talk a little bit about your sleeping habits, but also the benefits of sleeping to your health? So when people start off fasting and your body's going through all these changes, trying to reset your metabolism, um, most of the weight you lose in the first two, three, four weeks is water weight. And that can cause you to uh, have a lot of sleep interruption. And then when your body trans um, moves on to getting you into ketosis, which is burning your fats instead of burning the sugars in your blood and your glycogen, your brain isn't used to this. It gets supercharged. And it's really hard for a lot of people to, to fall asleep, to sleep or stay asleep. Yeah. yeah. Cause you're, I, you're I so feel jacked. I've, I'm jacked up. I feel totally jacked up the entire time. I have so much energy like right now, I'm fasting right now, and I have been fasting. Mm -hmm. I have it on my phone here. I downloaded the uh, fasting app uh, Zero. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Hey. Um, there's all of a sudden show. some music playing on my phone, and I don't know why. Um, you know, people are expecting well, about fasting. Yeah, yeah. So I've been fasting now for 14 hours. Mm -hmm. Jesus, that's a sec. I I have all sort of music playing on my phone. And I don't want it to play. Started playing bread. You know, the group bread. I love bread. Yeah, so I've been but only fasting during now. Your eating window. You can only enjoy <laughs> bread during your eating window. No, this is the band bread. I know. <laughs> and uh, my dog desperately wants to go on, sit on the balcony. Just one sec. And mm -hmm. um, just I'm just going to change the view here so you don't see me going mm -hmm. off to, uh, to, to let her out. Yeah, so go ahead and tell us a little bit more about sleeping. Well, I think it's generally recognized that sleep is one of the most important things you can do for your mental health and emotional health and just allowing your body to recover and repair itself. Most of the repair your body does is when you're sleeping. So for example, people think that weightlifting, which is really important, strength training is a must for almost all of us, that you get all the benefits from when you're actually lifting the weights and lowering the weights. That's not true. What you're doing is you're slightly damaging your muscles so that while you're sleeping and resting, your body goes into a repair and recovery mode. And that's when all the real work is done. Instead of running parallel, this process runs in serial. No serial jokes, please. And so, but everybody, again, we're an experiment of one. And some people can work perfectly on six hours of sleep. Some people need eight or 10 hours of sleep. So there's no one real number, despite what a lot of doctors say, has to get eight hours of sleep. That's absolutely not true. So if you wake up and you're refreshed and you're good to go for the next day, you've had the proper amount of sleep. Yeah. It might not just be easy to get to sleep when you're, just learning and your body's adapting to the when you, yeah so that explains it because that that basically is driving me nuts because i just 
I thought, okay, mm -hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to try to go to bed earlier and see if that helps. It doesn't help because last night I went to bed at nine o'clock and it didn't make any difference. I still woke up three, four times. And mm -hmm. uh, basically I got up this morning at six o'clock in the morning because I couldn't sleep anymore. I'm wide awake. And, you know, it's just, uh, so, so that's good to know. So it's just your body is now adjusting to this intermittent fasting journey that is going to be part of my life and is now part of your life, the rest of your mm -hmm. life. And that's mm -hmm. um, indeed that the, the word diet is not a part of this intermittent fasting world. It's not a not diet. At not at all. Do so you want to elaborate a bit on that? Well, a diet is telling you what you can eat. Intermittent fasting takes us back to our roots before we were very industrialized. And intermittent fasting was the way everybody ate. Yeah. I mean, you had no guaranteed food sources. So your body developed mechanisms or evolved mechanisms to make sure you could stay alive during those times that were more famine than feast. Yep. And it's part of our, our genetic code. Yep. Yep. And it's and it's something well, the hunter gatherer going back to the caveman times, you know, you you're going out mm -hmm. during the day and you're sleeping at night because uh, you don't want to go at night out at night for fear of not mm -hmm. being able to see, you know, a tiger that's going to come and eat you. But you're going to mm -hmm. go out hunting during the day and sometimes you may not get anything. And so you have to wait till the next time and the next time and the next time. So in the meantime, your body is going into a fasting mode and it's burning the fat not the sugars in your body yeah. and i i always use the example of a bear a bear is eating and eating and eating for months and then he goes into hibernation and during hibernation he is basically um burning the fat that's been stored in his body because he got really really fat and so the your heart and your lungs and your brain and all of that thing that all those things that take energy the energy is coming from the fat and that um and um, not the muscle and not the muscle you don't lose muscle and that's another thing that that um that is so interesting about this uh, entire topic of inter uh, intermittent fasting is you're not losing muscle you're losing you're burning fat you're not losing right. muscle you don't lose muscle you, you in some cases you actually can gain muscle and mm -hmm. um, and so have you have you noticed an overall change in your body and um, do you go on a scale, for example, at all and, and check your weight, or is that not a part of your routine? I do not use the scale at all. I go by the size of my clothes. Okay. And that's that's it. I understand that some people need the numbers. It, to me, it really doesn't matter what number is on the scale as long yeah. as I'm feeling good and I'm able to function. I find it funny. I have a lot of doctor's appointments. and Every time I go, they want me to get on the scale and they want to measure my height. So I tell them, I don't want to know what the scale says. I don't right. care. And um, I've never gone into an appointment with a doctor. And he says, look at this. You're still five foot seven. Way to go. I'm keeping your height. It's true. But it's true. Well, never it, it, has a doctor mentioned height. No, no. Well, I was I was at my family doctor yesterday because I needed to get all the blood work. I needed to, you know, get them on board and tell them I'm doing intermittent fasting. And and and, you know, I was talking about the obesity code from Dr. Jason Fung and my doctor knew about this. And that mm -hmm. is great. So that's is the word is spreading amongst the healthcare uh, uh community the importance the the incredible importance and health benefits of intermittent fasting so what sort of health improvements do you feel yourself like say obviously before you you um were finally diagnosed and you, you you're not fainting anymore and but do you find over what is your overall feeling of health at the moment i've probably never felt better in my life. Wow, that's great. At my heaviest, I was 340 pounds. And every joint in my body ached. Right. Now, it's probably a combination of the weight and that I grew up playing hockey. 
course, I'm Canadian. It's the law. Yay, hockey. Rugby. <laughs> it's I the law. Football. That's hilarious. Well, I played I yeah. played street hockey growing up in Don Mills, and, and we were on mm-hmm. the street, and I loved, loved playing hockey. Car! Car! <laughs> Any Canadian knows what that means. So I wasn't thinking clearly. I had I was actually born, I had a stroke at birth which didn't get diagnosed until I was wow. an adult. So the left side of my body is is slightly paralyzed from that. Okay. So there's there's a lot of things I've had to heal and work on over the years. But I guess getting rid of type 2 diabetes, even my endocrinologist couldn't believe I did that. Mm, great. A lot of medical practitioners are just so into their groove that they can't upload new information no. like Dr. Fung did. And no. it's just outside their mindset. But this is you know, just another fad diet. It's not. And, and do you blame them actually? Because, you know, um, there's a, another podcaster that I listen to. Um, it's called the maintenance phase. And she basically mm-hmm. has debunked every single diet for the last 50 years and talking about that on our podcast. And, uh, uh, she, it's it's just everything from Weight Watchers to um, Dr. Atkins. I did Dr. Atkins too. We I've done every diet on on the planet as well, and always mm-hmm. had a regain. Always had a regain. And again, there's that dirty word D I E T four letter word. It's a four letter word, and it and it should have mm-hmm. nothing to do with anybody and their. Um, their meal plan or their their journey or not a, not even a journey it should just be the way you eat mm-hmm. that um i lost my train of thought oh no but the benefits 65 hits again 65 hits again isn't it lovely isn't it lovely so uh the benefits of um of uh your diet and lifestyle changes so the thing that i'm having mm-hmm. a really hard time with is artificial sweeteners so mm-hmm. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the artificial sweeteners? Do you use them? I do not knowingly use them. I'm sure there's something I've eaten in the past four years that had them, but I will not knowingly eat artificial sweeteners. And can you explain to our listeners why? Artificial sweeteners are marketed as anti-sugar so they're low calorie. If it's low calorie, it must be good for your body because we all want to cut calories. And they don't talk about the chemical effect that these artificial sweeteners have on your body and metabolism. So when your body senses this sugar, the sweet taste, it's not really sh- the sweet taste, but there's no sugar, there's no energy coming in it starts to pump out more insulin. So yep. at the beginning of our talk, I said all these things would start to circle back on each other. So your body starts producing more insulin and it can actually cause you to have lower blood sugars because it's trying to take sugars out that shouldn't be taken out at the time. And the level of sweetness that your body senses from these artificial sweeteners is just off the charts. And that also messes with your satiety and and hunger. It's not a good system for your body. It's like, if you start replacing your blood with molasses, your body's just not going to work. No, you're not going to be able to breathe properly. No, it's energy. Yeah. So it's an artificial product. And, and that's the thing about, um, about uh, intermittent fasting, because you have a small window to eat, you automatically start choosing healthy whole foods that will give you a sense of satiety. I always eat my protein first, so that it fills me up and I know my body needs it. And then I go to the vegetables. Um, maybe if I have a little bit of room left, I may do, like last night I had half a sweet potato for dinner mm-hmm. together with some kale and some chicken. and. But the thing about artificial sweeteners is is exactly that crazy, crazy idea that also discover, discovered for myself, because I always put artificial sweeteners in my coffee in the morning. 
And while I was mm-hmm. reading this book and they were saying no artificial sweeteners when you're fasting because it spikes your insulin. So the whole point of mm-hmm. fasting is to lower your insulin levels so that you start burning. And the interesting thing about this um, app, this app I'm using, Zero, it actually tells you at one point, at one point during your hour fasting when you're actually starting to burn fat. And because um, there's this, like a small window, and then at one point mm-hmm. it says, "Now you're burning fat," but that will stop the moment you eat or drink anything that is sweet, fake mm-hmm. or real. So fake being mm-hmm. an artificial sweetener, stevia. Exitol, any artificial sweetener, even if you swish it in your mouth and spit mm-hmm. it out again, your brain says, oh, there's something sweet. I'm going to tell my pancreas to produce some insulin. Insulin level mm-hmm. goes up. You're no longer benefiting from what intermittent fasting does, that it burns your fat. Mm-hmm. So do you use, artif- you don't use artificial sweeteners at all on in your eating window? Correct. I don't use yeah. them in my fasting window either. No, no, of course not. No, that we established <laughs> you, you should not be yeah. doing. But yeah. um, uh, because Jen was actually talking about how she does use sugar in her eating mm-hmm. window. So she does eat yeah. sugar. You eat, you eat not sugar. Not a lot. No. Yeah. So, so do you but drink coffee? I'd like coffee? you to make a note. Yeah. I'm not a coffee drinker. I'd like you to make a note about the fasting app and when it tells you you're getting into ketosis. Because Jen will have a lot more to say about that. Okay. Okay. Great. Great. I'm yeah. I, like I'm a newbie. I'm 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 a yeah. rookie. I'm a rookie. So there's there's probably lots of things that are, that will change uh, over time. And you know I'm just going by whatever information I can find on Facebook and on the different groups that I've joined and things like that about um, intermittent fasting. So when you're when you what is your suggestion for anybody that is um, interested in trying uh, to do intermittent fasting to not just lose weight, but to improve their health? What sort of other health benefits have you heard or read about um, that also help uh, with, if you um, practice intermittent fasting? Personally, also reverse my sleep apnea, which the doctor said he's never seen before. Yeah, that's amazing. Did you use a CPAP machine? I did use a CPAP for many years. Yeah. And I know I almost never snore anymore. I mean, everybody snores occasionally, but um, it's it's not an issue for me anymore. And remember, I've been in the hospital probably 30 times for (laughs) my various adventures. You know, none of the nurses have remarked that I was keeping the other patients in the hospital up. Well, that's good. Yeah, because because you uh, do you live alone, obviously, or not obviously. Mm-hmm. Do you live alone? So how? Yeah, yes. how can you track something unless you record yourself sleeping? Yeah. Well, you know the phones all have apps for your sleep help and everything now. Yeah. So yeah. you know, there's also that. Yeah. I don't wake up. I wake up in the morning refreshed. Great. So- you feel Which like you've is, had a really good night's sleep because I, I'm still feeling tired, but I'm in the beginning stage. Yeah. And what are there some mm-hmm. other benefits? What are the other health benefits? You were talking about, I don't have aches and pains anymore. Yeah, that was probably two to three months in. Mm-hmm. I mean, it used to be difficult for me to even get out of bed. And my father had really bad arthritis, probably the worst case of arthritis I've ever seen in my life. And I thought that was my future in two, three months into the fasting. And I was getting into longer fasts then. I was getting into 20, 22 hour fasts. It just went away. All that inflammation in my joints went away. And I don't have an ache or pain in my body. Which wow. is, for all the damage I've inflicted on myself, for, you know, I've been hit by cars while I was riding my bike a number of times. Yeah. You know, it's it's remarkable that that I am so pain free, and that's due to the intermittent fasting helping you get rid of a lot of the body wide inflammation, yeah. and it's just gone. 
Yeah, yeah. The the way Jin explains it, and she she calls it garbage, getting rid of your garbage out of your body, and that the intermittent fasting basically does a great cleanup of your system. And the the garbage or cleanup can include things like um, inflammation, and that there's less information inflammation. I have lots and lots of aches and pains. I have arthritis, and I'm looking forward to uh, six months from now to see the difference before and after of um because i'm going to go see a, a physiotherapist about this neck pain i'm having hopefully um that will with this intermittent fasting that will be less as well i've heard some mm-hmm. crazy uh, some interesting things or not crazy but interesting things about eyesight yes so many people have reported remember when i was one of jen's moderators we had something like three hundred and fifty thousand people in the group so you know the the variety and breadth and depth of the questions were were mind blowing. But many people reported that their eyesight was getting better. I had diabetic retinopathy. I had some pretty serious leakage in my left eye um, from the diabetes, and now it has essentially disappeared. And again, it's another one of those things that the eye surgeon says. We've never seen this before. That's incredible. That's incredible. And then, so you, you have uh, less pain, uh, you're sleeping better, you're seeing better. Is there anything mm-hmm. else that you um, can enlighten us with, with some changes? No more migraines. There never we go. A migraine. Um, I've never had a headache in my life, so I don't know. Uh, but I have heard and uh, I, I have friends who have severe migraines. And mm-hmm. so you used to have severe migraines. And was that related to your concussions or was just in general? You don't know if it I was. Think, I think for some people, migraines are genetic hereditary. My mom used to have horrible migraines. Okay. Um, I don't think mine were anywhere near as bad as hers. Yeah, my my friend Glory used to have these horrible migraines, and yeah. you get these auras, and you know couldn't see. So, mine were you know next level headaches, but uh, those have gone away completely. My asthma's gone away. Most of my allergies have gone away. You know, there's probably a dozen other things that I could list, but your asthma has gone away. Yeah. Yeah, that is quite something too. So you were just mentioning uh, Dr. Dr. Jason Fung's book about uh, willpower. Can you repeat that for us? Sure. I'm paraphrasing here, but Jason says he and I are on a first name basis. Great. Uh, You've met him? No. no I'm sure. all, all my doctors have, but I haven't. Uh, he, he boils it down to hormones beat willpower 24-7. 365 days a year. So if you're caught in the diet trap and you're beating yourself up because, oh, I failed another diet or I did so well and then I gained back you know, everything I lost plus another 10 or 15% or whatever it is, it's not a fair fight. You can't beat your hormones. Your hormones are working in your body as part of your genetic structure. And until you get your hormones adjusted, you're generally going to be in a losing battle. And, and the, what you'll also... Go ahead. Yeah, sorry, go, go ahead. And you also... And you'll also find, as many people have, once they've been intermittent fasting and they've flipped that metabolic switch and your brain's running on ketones, you will have a renewed sense of calm and confidence. And a lot of that negative talk will go away. I've experienced it dozens and dozens and dozens of people in the group have experienced it. And you can just see by talking to them, they're just different people. Hmm. And Interesting. I'll use my friend Susie Stone in Los Angeles. Uh, I finally got her to try intermittent fasting and it gave her the confidence to apply for jobs she didn't think she could get. And now she's been with an insurance company for a number of years doing really well. And she attributes it to intermittent fasting. Yeah. Well, and, and that's the thing, you know, if you're, if you're the type of person, like you mentioned before, of uh, you just uh, dive right in and do it, 
uh, or you're the, oh, I got to talk to my medical practitioner and should I really be doing this and let me do some more research about it. I'm the dive right in kind of person because after I mm -hmm. read Jason Fung's book, I did mm -hmm. the 24 hour fast that he suggests. So it's 24 hours of fasting and then you can eat three meals. Um, <laughs> You don't have to start that stringent. I started really stringent and then, but the indeed that you have the different, uh, the different types of, of intermittent fasting where you can just do 16 hours of fasting or even 10 hours of fasting, but just start mm -hmm. with the idea of, uh, of trying to build up more hours in your intermittent fasting does more repair to your body. Absolutely. And as a general rule, you know, probably 16 hours is the minimum to get significant results or things that you will notice. Yeah. Um, but of course, any fasting is good. Fasting. Yeah, it's going to happen. Well, that's great. That's great. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge list. And again, going back to why this seems to be a big, deep, dark secret, at least this is the first time I actually, and I have no idea how I came across the obesity code from Dr. Jason Fung, but when I read it, I have dyslexia. So I listen to Audible and I look at the words at the same time. And when I was reading this book, it was like one of those, my brain was exploding over and over and over again. Like, why mm -hmm. didn't I know about this? Why didn't I know about this? And and even within the bariatric community, because there's um, uh, someone that I recently uh, met, Allison, who has started up a Facebook group um, uh, for in in the for those who have had bariatric surgery and are practicing intermittent fasting. So it's still small, the group, um, only about 800 members. There should be 800,000 members because so many people in North America have had bariatric surgery and are experiencing weight regain. And mm -hmm. they just go back to the calorie in, calorie out thing, or they go to the gym seven days a week and try it, burn it off, whatever that way. But it's not, it's not the reason. It's this, it's this insulin resistance that you have basically too much. The only way that your fat is going to be burned is fasting. And so um, let's talk a bit about your book. So we see the image of your book in the background there, mm -hmm. the summer I die 20 times. And this a little book forward by Jen Stevens. Yeah, Jen Stevens, again, we talked about Jen Stevens a couple of times. So Jen Stevens is a New York Times uh, bestseller book writing author. She has a podcast. She also has a Facebook group and um, she has an online community that you can join. Mm -hmm. And um, just just a, a little bit about your book and then we'll talk a little bit about Jen because Jen is coming on my podcast as well. But talk talk to us about your book and and at what point were you uh, fasting when you wrote the book? Did you start intermittent Partially, fasting? Yeah. I started it early after all, all my head trauma as part of a journaling experiment from uh, my therapist. And the problem with me journaling, what happened to me is I had so much head damage, memory loss and everything. I couldn't remember things to journal. Okay. And even when I did remember things, I wasn't sure what if what I remembered was accurate. So I had started journaling and kind of gave up on it, but I still had a story that I could tell to people. Right. And, you know, when you start off a conversation or a talk to somebody with, hi, my name's Fred. I've been dead multiple times. And uh, it kind of gets their attention. So at some point along this voyage, somebody suggested to me that I enter my story in a short story competition. And I've always been a writer. I wrote for the school newspaper. I was a marketer. I was a professor. I know how to write. But writing a book and a story is different than writing marketing copy or a business book. So I tried to write this short story and I could not get under the maximum word count. I just didn't have the skills and the capacity at that point. So I kept it in the back pocket and as I fasted and became more 
healthy mentally and emotionally, I began to pick up steam. And oddly enough, I wrote most of the book during COVID. Because I was just sitting on the deck, looking into the park behind where I lived. And I was pounding out, you know, a thousand, fifteen hundred words a day. And because uh, really, what else can you do? So you you mentioned your uh, for your school, you're a teacher and a professor. Where did you uh, teach, and where I were you a at professor? All the colleges in Toronto. What did you teach? I was business. I taught marketing and finance <clears throat> and communication and strategy. So I have an MBA in uh, marketing and finance. I did a double major because doing one major wasn't tough enough. Great. And uh, I also have a certification in adult ed, which is pretty much the equivalent of a master's in adult ed. Yes, that's wonderful. And so your book is available on Amazon. Um, so the <clears throat> the other thing where you were talking about with uh, Jen Stevens, that you were a, monitor, a moderator and that you were, mm -hmm. there were 300,000 people. What was this online or what was this? Yeah, that was the Facebook group. The, the Facebook group now still exists. <clears throat> Jen's not on it anymore and we don't moderate it. People just can use it as a resource to look up questions about fasting. She's dedicated to her <clears> online <throat> community. And it was an amazing thing. And one of the things I didn't notice, and I haven't actually mentioned this to Jim, is when we were moderating, there was, I think, up to 60 of us at some points. And we were all volunteers. Personally, I got so immersed with it that... It just reinforced fasting, you know, almost 24 seven. And when she decided to shut down the group, it left a big hole in me, you know, even though you're supporting other people, that's also reinforcing and supporting yourself. Well, and, and that's basically the, the whole point of my podcast and the whole point of my YouTube channel was that I'm supporting myself. I'm, I'm, I'm just, it just keeps me going because exactly mm -hmm. during the pandemic where I experienced a weight regain during the pandemic, I didn't want to broadcast that on YouTube as many people sort of stop um, broadcasting or stop posting videos or stop using the Facebook group or whatever when they, when they get off track. And then, so I started playing my horn because I'm a professional or retired professional horn player. And I just had these mm -hmm. mini concerts during the pandemic. But at the same time, I was sitting on the couch and stuffing my face with food because there was nothing mm -hmm. else to do. And um, it was really, really uh, tough. And a lot of people that, um, you know, we call that COVID kilos, a lot of people gained weight during the pandemic. And, sure. um, and and to get back on track, like I, I see now, you know, this week was the first week of school. All the kids are going back to school. So I see myself as, okay, so I've now have a, a changed my lifestyle. And I, it's like going back to school and getting shiny brand new pencils and new binders. And, you know, that was, that mm -hmm. was always fun and a new agenda and that sort of thing. So we're, we're getting towards the end of our one hour discussion. If you were mm -hmm. to... Um, if you were to share any of your experiences, if somebody were to say, all this information is amazing, but where do I start and how do I do this? And what would be a good place to start if they're just like thinking, maybe I should look into this? The first thing you should consider being honest with your own personality. So some people are very risk averse. Some people like to take risks. Some people are, you know, rip off the Band-Aid. I'm just going to start with a 20-hour a fast, uh, you know, and go from there. And some people, are, you know, I have to talk to my doctors, which is a good idea most of the time. And, um, you know, because one of the big challenges for me was I was on so many medications and they had no idea how that was going to affect yes. my body if I started fasting. Very complicated. Um, Jen will probably talk about this more, but it's not recommended for children. It's not recommended for women who are pregnant or breastfeeding or if you've had a, an eating disorder. So, you know, those, those are the precautions. But when you do this deep dive into being honest with yourself and how your diet history has been and, 
you know, what supports do you have? Then you can say, okay, maybe I should just start with a 16, eight, mm -hmm. or maybe I'll jump in the pool. And, and again, 16, eight. Fast. Yes. And again, just to remind people a 16, eight means 16 hours of fasting and an eight hour eating window. And that eight hour eating window can be anything from 10 in the morning till six at night. That's your eight hour mm -hmm. eating window. And then after that, it's fasting. So I'm, I'm probably OMAD now for the most part, which is one meal a day. OMAD, O-A-D, OMAD, yeah. OMAD. So yeah, there's lots of fasting lingo. So the, uh, and what a meal is will differ between people. So, you know, for me, it's just a regular meal and maybe I'll have a dessert or a snack yeah. later. That's it. That's it. And so, uh, so for reading material, uh, of course, uh, I started with the obesity code from Dr. Jason Fung. If and you're a very sciencey person, you will love that book. Yeah. And you have to remember, I think that came out in 2014. So, you know, a lot of the information in that book was sort of very primary. Mm -hmm. And because it was research from like 2008 to 2014. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's been so many advances in the intermittent fasting world research. For example, Japanese scientists won the Nobel Prize in 2016 for the concept of autophagy, or if you live other places, autophagy. And what does that, that mean? Your, your body is incredibly smart, and we have lots of proteins floating around in our body. However, sometimes they get mislabeled and misused and not processed. So there's a lot of protein buildup in your cells that keep them from running efficiently. Autophagy is a process that is running 24 seven, but at different speeds. And it helps clean out your cells and get rid of all these misplaced proteins to help your body run more efficiently. You won't notice it, you know, but it's measurable. Things you will notice is if you have scars, they will start to disappear. Women in the group mentioned that they had 30 year old cesarean scars that started to fade. Wow. You know, varicose veins, things like that. Um, I don't know if you can really see it, but I've got a little burn mark on my arm and every three months, it just starts to scab over again and scab over again, and it's gone. I know all the scars I have from my various heart surgeries, and there's been 12 of them. They're not disappeared, but they're fading fast. Yeah. And especially if I compare it to others I've seen with the same scarring, I'm way ahead of them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the thing that blew my mind when I was uh, reading Jen's book was uh, was also about extra skin so uh with the extra skin that if you have a lot of uh if you're doing um if you're doing intermittent fasting to lose weight you're going to have extra skin um, in the case mm -hmm. of bariatric patients i have a lot of extra skin but mm -hmm. that intermittent fasting helps with the elasticity of your skin as well but a caveat note it has to, it also is age related, whether or not a woman is going through menopause or not. Yes, I'm definitely not going through menopause. If we're a big part of, of your, skin your humor is totally dry. <laughs> thank you. Um, a big part of <laughs> your skin, your cellular rigidity is collagen. Yes. Which is a protein. So if you've got all those extra proteins in the loose skin, that's one of the things autophagy can work on. Right. Okay. So there's the autophagy again. That is quite amazing. So, um, so obviously the benefits are just phenomenal with intermittent fasting and that um, having a support system uh, is very important and, and also being able to talk to somebody or having a partner that, um, that, also uh, wants to do intermittent fasting because that's 
uh, within the bariatric community was a, a big issue with a lot of people who there's only one person in the family who has had the bariatric surgery and uh, and it was a challenge with uh, discussions around meal time or can you eat can you not eat and there's a lot of pressure there mm -hmm. do you have any so your your connection to this support system to this uh, IF uh, there's a lot of acronyms mm -hmm. in the in the intermittent fasting world in the IF community, the intermittent fasting community. Do you do you speak to someone or do you reach out to people on a daily basis? I am always promoting it to other yeah. people. I've helped a lot of people, or intermittent fasting has helped a lot of people. Now I'm at a point where I'm pretty self sufficient. Uh, if I have something that I really don't understand or I can't remember. For example, somebody asked me if it would help their gallstones. And I couldn't remember if we had ever addressed that. Mm. So, you know, I would just ask Jen or Sherry Bullock, who's one of the yeah. partners in her new community. So there's a lot of people that I'm still in touch with that right. were part of the moderating community. You know, if I don't know something, they likely do. Or yeah. just go to Jen. It's it's research, 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 learning that it's mm. it's um, again, what you pointed out earlier is that um, a lot of health care health care providers are not up to up to date or up to up to speed on the benefits of intermittent fasting, that it just seems mm. to be they're busy people. They have to know everything and anything about, I don't know, hip replacement surgery or whatever, but going Having a specialist like a dietitian, uh, I'm going to see a dietitian shortly, and I'll be interested to see how much they know about intermittent fasting. And I, I hope not. I'm I'm hoping they do know more because otherwise, it's like okay, it's up to us again to figure it out. Kind of like, you know, the film Lorenzo's Oil with Susan Sarandon. Did you ever see that film? Well, there. No, I'm terrible with films. Okay, it doesn't matter. So her her son came to uh, was diagnosed with a, with a horrendous um, disease, and Susan Sarandon's character and her husband did everything and anything to research a cure and look for a cure, mm -hmm. and they found one uh, because their healthcare providers could not provide the information. So you mm -hmm. are your best healthcare manager, basically. If you can't get an answer from your healthcare provider, you need to do the research. If you don't mm -hmm. do the research yourself, you're never going to find it. And that's what I've been finding over and over again um, with this, uh, with, with life in general. We're very fortunate here in Canada that we, uh, that our healthcare system is paid for, it's free, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's a be all and end all because you still are sometimes forced or you're, you're face to face with a, with a health practitioner that knows nothing about the topic you're talking about and yeah. you're like well what's the point so my famous saying is ask questions over and over again until there are no more questions to be answered you're out of mm -hmm. questions because you found your answer our medical system in canada is a blessing and a curse one of my doctors tore ligaments in their knee and they don't get a bump up in the queue any more than we do no. He's been waiting, you know, six months to see an orthopedic surgeon. Yeah. And uh, so there's these long, long wait lists. But on yeah. my own podcast, which I hadn't mentioned. Oh, yes. Um, I mentioned your podcast as well. Sorry. Go ahead. Thank you. It's called the Dead Man Walking Podcast. There's sort of this dead theme that runs through stuff that I do. Um, and I just had Sohail Gandhi on. He's the past president of the Ontario Medical Association. And he's, you know, got some pointed things to say about the bureaucrats that have taken over the medical system. Right. And even just, you know, that um, we are so short of doctors that we could just pay and get rid of the bureaucrats and the system would run so much better and be, there'd be much shorter wait lists and shortages of everything. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's not the perfect, it's not the perfect soup, and it's basically politically driven, which is unfortunate. And uh, mm -hmm. I don't want to get into that discussion because I, I am not a fan of the present uh, provincial government, but many mm -hmm. people aren't, and some people are, mm -hmm. whatever. But this has been an incredible, incredible interview, and it's you're you're the kickoff to my whole 
new IF journey and the IF journey for friends and family and who's ever listening and uh, we're you and I are spreading the word you and I are spreading mm -hmm. the benefits of um, and in and, and educating people the the you know I'm an mm -hmm. educator I'm a teacher I also love to share my experiences and and find other people out there that have knowledge and and experience like you have yourself and that i will be obviously i'm putting all the links in of your podcast and the links to your book and the links to jen's book and jen's podcast and i think it's been wonderful that you've been here today and and for sure come back i'd love to love to have you back on on the podcast channel and uh and we you know we can talk maybe six months from now and i'll tell you how i'm doing and uh you tell wonderful. me how you're doing it's just meant to be you know it's a community mm -hmm. and it takes a village as i always say it takes a village right so if we're mm -hmm. we're all trying to get healthier because living in north america is sure a heck a challenge you know you turn on the tv and every five minutes there's a commercial about this junk food and that junk food and you are just in, inundated with the fact that you need to be eating all day long yeah and then there's a commercial for the medication to counteract all the foods. Well, the that thing that was the food. most shocking for me when I was watching the Olympics, and I mentioned this in another podcast as well, is that I was watching the Olympics on CBC, and every 15 mm -hmm. minutes there was an Ozempic commercial. And it was like, yeah. okay, here you are watching all of these really fit, beautiful, athletic bodies and you're on the couch eating your chips or your chocolate or whatever you do on the couch when you're watching the Olympics. And then there's this Ozempic commercial. And that to me was fat shaming because the Ozempic commercial was not targeted to those who have diabetes. It was targeted to those that are trying to lose weight. And again, mm -hmm. you know, we're with the, the marketing machine, the multi-trillion dollar marketing machines are constantly telling you that you need to try this diet or that diet, and the pharmaceutical uh, companies, the multi-trillion dollar pharmaceutical companies are trying to sell you Ozempic or Wagovi, and it's not about artificial this or that. It's about what you eat and when you eat, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So and it's just been, let your body heal. Let your body heal, exactly. You know, it's broken. Put a Band-Aid on it and fix it. And the Band-Aid in this mm -hmm. case is IF, intermittent fasting. Well, Fred, mm -hmm. it's been wonderful speaking to you today. And thank you so much to, uh, sure. for everybody listening. Thank you so much. And, um, and we hope to see you again at another podcast. And keep on following. And don't forget to subscribe to my podcast because there are lots of really exciting guests coming. Jen Steven is coming and also Allison, I forget her last name, Allison, who is uh, doing intermittent fasting and she's had bariatric surgery. So, um, yeah, they're going to be back. They're going to be on the podcast soon. So um, thanks for, for listening. <laughs>